My name is Rod Flower and I'm Professor of Biochemical Pharmacology here at the William Harvey Research Institute in St Bart's and the Royal London School of Medicine and Dentistry at Queen Mary College London. And I'm speaking today to my guest, uh, Professor Gustav Born. Uh, Gus is uh, very distinguished for his work in cardiovascular pharmacology and physiology and particularly for his work on platelet biology. He's been elected a Fellow of the Royal Society He's actually a Royal Society medalist. He has some 10 honorary degrees and something like 20 other awards. So in Edinburgh, you graduated in, in, in medicine and then, yes. th then the war came. You served in the war uh, as yes. in the Royal Army Medical Corps, yes. didn't you? And you saw um, action all over the world, but I think you had some experiences in the Far East, yes. which triggered off one of your major lifelong yes. interests. So maybe yes. you can tell us about your experiences in, in Japan? I was in the RAMC for nearly four years uh, on active service in the Far East. Uh, I was in India uh, when the bomb was dropped on the 6th of August 1945, the atom bomb on Hiroshima. I was at that time a member of what was going to be the invasion force, the British invasion force uh, for Japan. Uh, after the bomb and after they sued for peace, it was turned into the occupation force. And we sailed to a place called Hiro on the Inland Sea in Japan, which was only a few miles from Hiroshima. It was, of course, an experience the like of which one doesn't want and has once, I hope, in a lifetime. The British Army, in its best tradition, in the hospital we had, looked after the local population as well as our own people. And an Australian battalion, we had that too. And amongst the patients, the people whom we had to look after, were hundreds of Japanese who had survived the bomb from around Hiroshima, but who were bleeding unstoppably. And they were bleeding from all parts of the body, into the skin, the mucous membranes, internally. I knew that that was from thrombocytopenia, from a lack of blood platelets. Platelets are little cells in the blood which are designed to stop small hemorrhages all over the body. And th they had lost those because the radiation from the bomb had destroyed the cells in the bone marrow. That, of course, was another deep impression mm. and interested me greatly. Mm. And you're quite right in saying that was one of the mm. starting points of my later work. Mm. And I suppose your, your name will always be linked to the invention of the platelet aggregometer, mm. yeah. which you actually <laughs> invented at that time and, yeah. and, and built the first prototype. Yeah. And um, I see that the first paper you published on the aggregometer was in 1960. Two or something. How did the invention of the aggregometer itself come about? Well, it came, that was, <laughs> I say in my autobiographical notes, that's the only useful thing that came out of my DPhil in Oxford. We, we measured a, a ribonuclease activity and also the growth of the mold, uh, sort of uh, optically, I mean, by turbul turbulimetrically, yes. you know, yes. pushing light through a suspension. And then I thought, well, you know, for platelets, it's ideal. You've got you centrifuge away the red cells in the blood. You're left with plasma containing millions of platelets, shining light through it, and as they aggregate, they clump together, mm -hmm. and the light going through it increases. Mm -hmm. It's a very banal idea. <laughs> it's very funny because it really what we did with it was the important thing, not the idea, but for some reason, uh, it was quite interesting because. Eleven firms began to make these aggregometers measuring platelet irrigation by shining a light through the mm. tube. <coughs> you yourself, of course, yes. then invented another device yeah. which was mu much closer to real life. Well. I mean, the, the flower, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly, uh, device. But it, it was enormously influential as a technique, wasn't it? And I mean, yeah. it used you know, in hospital laboratories for diagnostic purposes. Yes. Um, and as, I've, as we often discussed before, it was the first example, I think, where you could actually do single-cell pharmacology on, on human cells That's right. ever, because you know, yes. platelets are easy to prepare yes. in a, in a, in a in, very, very pure, in a pure uh, form. So, yeah. and, and you, know, you can do yeah. it in, in a quarter of an hour. Yeah. If you were giving advice to you know, young people yes. starting out in science, what yes. would you 
say to them? I mean, what are the most important attributes of a scientist, do you yes. think? Yes. Curiosity is really the most important thing. And a strong desire to do research, to try and find something out. Whatever has grabbed you as a student, and really all medical and science students, they get interested in something or other, sometimes very much so, very deeply. And it's very important to keep those interests very much in the forefront of your mind. But there's a second piece of advice. Then when you have a chance of working in research, who you work as is much more important than what you are working on. I speak from experience, <laughs> you know. And I think that was my father's success. People came to him from all over the world because they admired the way he behaved and did things. Mm. I think that's the important thing, really. And now we live in a climate where money is much shorter, and that's pretty sad. Mm. But we never had much money, you and I, no. but just enough to enjoy ourselves. Professor Bourne, thank you very, very much indeed. It was a pleasure yeah. talking to you.